Welcome, Climate Viewers. This is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at climateviewer.com. I get asked this question constantly. What's the big picture, Jim? When it comes to weather control, weather warfare, geoengineering, what is the big picture? I'm going to share that with you today. Something I have not shared with anybody anywhere before. And you're going to take a trip inside my mind. And we're going to do a different kind of map. A mind map, if you will. And kind of give you the big picture. And then... In a later series of videos, I'm going to break down each of the individual parts of this mind map of the climate changers. For those who are new here, please hit that subscribe button. Click that little bell. Um, and if you can, support this free open source uh, work that I do. By giving a monthly donation on Patreon or a single donation on PayPal or GoFundMe, always appreciated. But let's uh, let's just take a good peek at what is a mind map. I mean, what what are we talking about here? So we're talking about the climate changers. Now, this is a term that I use to generically describe all of the individuals who willingly change the climate, not just your normal climate change narrative, the fact that for over 150 years, well, yeah, roughly 100 years, at least a century, man has attempted to change the local weather. And if you change weather over a long enough time, you change the climate. Therefore, these are the climate changers. And especially when we're talking about geoengineering, we're really getting into a subject they can get even deeper than that. So I wanted to kind of map all of this out and have like an overview, something that I could use to visually show people the size and scope of the problem. And that's what this is here. And we're going to go through how big this problem actually is in graphic detail. Now, as you can see, there, there's a lot of links on this tree. That this tree has many roots. And obviously, I want to keep this video short because I want people to see the big picture very quickly. And then we'll break down the branches of this tree of the climate changers so that we can really understand it. So we're going to zoom back in here and really just go to the meat and potatoes. What the heck is this all about? To fully understand climate change, one must acknowledge that over the past century, there have been three constants. Fossil fuel giants have intended to melt the Arctic and are already drilling in the Arctic. Scientists and governments from local to national, from commercial to military, have been controlling the weather. And that climate change legislation is about control of human and natural resources. I want to restate that. Climate change legislation is about control of human and natural resources. Because that's what this is all about. So let's start with the first one. Fossil fuel giants intended to melt the Arctic, melt the Arctic, and are already drilling in the Arctic. Plans to intentionally melt the Arctic. Jules Verne, 1889, fire a cannon, tilt Earth's axis, melt poles, reroute warm ocean currents to melt the polar ice caps, 1887. 1912, to move Earth and melt the pole, end of iceberg menace. 1929, space mirrors to focus sunlight and melt polar ice caps. 1945, nuke the Arctic to melt the poles, um, or as they put it, atomize the Arctic. Oh, by the way, they did that. You can see a map on climateviewer.org of 2,615 nuclear detonations and test explosions, many of which occurred in the Arctic. Metal particle ring, space ring to melt the Arctic, 1958. Oh, yeah, they did that. It was called Project Westford Needles. Of course, they said this was about you know, creating an artificial ionosphere to reflect um, radio waves. But regardless... Idea, 1958, medical particle space ring to melt the Arctic, 
1961-63, they dumped metal particle ring into space, considered to be one of the stupidest scientific projects, military projects, in the history of man. Damn the Bering Strait used nuclear-powered propellers to melt the poles, 1958. In a 1966 Committee on Atmospheric Sciences from the National Research Council stated in their report, weather and climate modification problems and prospects that jet aircraft are creating too much water vapor in the stratosphere and that could raise the Earth's surface temperature by 1.6 degrees Celsius and melt the poles. Guess what? That's exactly what's going on. And those planes make clouds. Those clouds are called cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds matter because Greenland ice sheet melts more when it's cloudy. 2016. Clouds enhance Greenland ice sheet meltwater runoff. These are all links to websites. This is nature.com right here. So um, you can actually click these links. At some point in the future, I will make this available um, to where you can click on this map yourself. Just keep that in mind. Cloud blanket warms up melting ice cap. So as we can see, long history, and I could actually make this way longer, and I probably will before this is all said and done, because as you can see, I can just grab these things and drag them around. And that's what's cool about mind maps, is that you can quickly map out very complex ideas. Mind maps, try them, they're fun. And as I said, they're also dr already drilling. The new Cold War for Arctic drilling, Arctic drilling wars. And you can see that here. The new Cold War drilling for oil and gas in the Arctic, Guardian, uh, 2015. The new Cold War, Russia sends troops and missiles to the Arctic as Putin stakes claim for regions, oil and gas reserves. The new Cold War, a ra the race for Arctic oil and gas um counting the cost America falling behind the new cold war over Arctic oil. And uh, of course the Arctic methane emergency group saying in uh, 2012, um, the Arctic natural gas extraction, liquefaction and sales angels proposal to save us from runaway global warming because of methane escaping from the Arctic. So talked about melting the poles to get to the ice. Poles, you know, allegedly already melting from all of this activity. And, uh, by the way, they're fighting like tooth and nail over drilling rights. I think that's pretty much summarized well in just these quick points, as you can see here. Next up, scientists of governments and governments from local to national for commercial to military have been controlling the weather Boy, that's a big one. So we come down this little purple line and we see climate chaos. And climate, the, the climate and weather are already chaotic enough. And I can't underscore this enough. There is no such thing as weather control. There is no such thing as climate control. There is climate modification. There's climate engineering. There's weather modification. There's weather experiments. There's geoengineering experiments. Um, it is such a chaotic system and people do not understand all of the variables involved to this day. Um, you know, cloud aerosol interaction is the greatest unknown in climate science and climate models. So we don't even understand how all the aerosols affect the clouds and what the radiation budget is, let alone how since 1946, when cloud seeding was invented, um, according to the National Academy of Sciences report in 2003, um, our you know opinion is still much the same as it was 40 years ago that cloud seeding has no efficacy, meaning that you cannot reproduce and predict what your results are going to be. You're just gambling with the weather. So that's why I say climate chaos. Now, this climate chaos can be broken down into multiple categories, but um, and I've even revised this, and we're going to go ahead and revise it right now because, as you'll see on the new uh, weather modification history, um, I throw this in an even broader category now. So we're going to call this weather modification, geoengineering, 
and space weather modification. Because space weather is a thing, and modification of that space weather is very similar to just weather modification in the troposphere, where we live, all that stuff. So we're going to have to keep that in mind. And I'll just pull these out of the way. Look at that. Nice to reorganize. Easy. Love mind maps. Um, I have my essential reading section. I like the 10 technologies done in the weather today. And just as an overview, you can see those 10 technologies in the infographic that I created. Um, and it basically shows the layers of the atmosphere, where the modifications occur. Um, and there's a version of this on weathermodificationhistory.com right now. Um, I've updated it clearly to remove the 2018 <laughs> from it and uh, did some slight modifications to it. But we basically, I have it in uh, 10 you know, technologies and the last three being what they call accidental geoengineering. They don't want to admit that these are intentional geoengineering because they're just pollution causing geoengineering on a global scale. But hell, it's it's all an accident. It's unintentional. Uh, it's inadvertent weather modification, as they like to put it. Um, and until proven otherwise, like I put down here, red numbers, considered inadvertent, accidental, or pollution unless intentional. Um, and not included in this uh, photo is steering atmospheric rivers because all the people who claim to do so have never showed me the technology so or how it works. But they basically say it's radio frequency, you know, resonance technology, things like that. Back to the story. So we'll know that that this is my essential reading thing, you know, like the patents, the companies, the names, the addresses, um, the geoengineering programs and weather modification laws in the United States of America, in addition to the world. Um, but, you know, that's that. And then President Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson uh, speaking on this sort of thing about weather modification and space weather modification. But we're going to go on down the line. So we're at the weather modification section. And you can see that this branches out quite significantly. Um, and we'll just quickly just touch on each of the, because like I said, I'm going to break this down in for, uh, further videos in more detail in the future. So we'll start with the first one. Cloud seeding, obviously invented in 1946. Many attempts at cloud seeding occurred before 1946. Um, but that was what, as James Roger Fleming, um, you know, my personal hero and the most prominent historian on weather modification, um, he wrote the book Fixing the Climate. Um, he referred to the period before 1946 as pluviculture. And that's where they were doing everything from burning pots of chemicals like Charles Hatfield, um, you know, when he made rain for San Diego and L.A., um, to electrified sand, to using x-rays and everything in between. Um, CW Post from Post Serial actually shooting cannons into the sky. Um, all of that was called pluviculture before 1946. So we, we were going to start at cloud seeding was invented by Vincent Schaefer, Schaefer Irving Langmire, and Bernard Vonnegut in 1946. And this was November 13th of 1946. And by October 13th of 1947, less than 11 months later, um, well, exactly 11 months later, Project Cirrus, the first hurricane cloud seeding experiment occurred. And that cloud, you know, that tropical storm promptly changed colors, changed directions, turned into a hurricane, and slammed into Georgia. Burn. Project Storm Fury, um, this is all under hurricane control. And then, the you know, in 1962 through 83, which is where the government tried to steer um, hurricanes. And then it gets revisited in, when Obama comes into office, um, Department of Homeland Security Hurricane Modification Workshop in 2008. That's your world of cloud seeding in a nutshell. Um, but that also includes things like rainfall enhancement, 
Um, did put a bunch of references on there. It kind of makes explains itself. You want to make more rain. So you put cloud seeds into the sky. Water vapor sticks to it. That makes uh, rain. Rainfall enhancement. Hail mitigation. You know, when you have large crops that they buy crop insurance and those crop insurance companies who sometimes insure these crops for millions of dollars then have a stake in making sure that the corn crop in Nebraska is not destroyed. So what do they do? They go and they pay cloud seeding companies uh, like Western Weather Consultants or Weather Modification Incorporated um, to go out and do what's called hail mitigation. And the idea is that you use cloud seeding, just like you would for rainfall, but to make the hail smaller. Now, of course, like I stated earlier, there's no efficacy to any of this cloud seeding um, mumbo jumbo. So they don't actually know whether they are making the hail smaller or let's say a couple states away, could they be making the hail larger? And that's why there needs to be more studies on this, more more eyeballs on this, more information um, to the public so that people are aware of these projects. That's why we're going to get we'll get to solutions at the end of this. Uh, big hint: this is one of those solutions. But regardless, hail mitigation, and then we go to the nefarious one: decrease rainfall. Russian cloud seeding prevents Chernobyl's radioactive rains reaching Moscow in 1986. Uh, I believe this is called Project Cyclone by one reporter. Going to need some more documentation on that because I don't read Russian, bruh. Chinese weather modification at the Beijing Olympics 2008. Um, CIA Project Nile Blue where the CIA was involved with what they called a rain embargo. Uh, doing cloud seeding over the Gulf of Mexico to ensure that rain did not fall on Cuba and um, basically to destroy Castro's sugar crops. And I haven't updated this since, but we would add the next one on. The fact that from 2011 through 2013, President Mahmoud Adinab Ahmadinejad from Iran said Europe was stealing Iran's reign. And then as late as 2018, a brigadier general from um, Iran said that basically Israel and other surrounding countries, Iran accuses Israel of cloud theft. It's right there. Which is in that whole weather warfare department. And that's where, like I said, the nefarious part happens. Um, and we talked about that ju just now, but the seeding near Cuba was to cause less rain, not more. It was supposed to squeeze rain out of the clouds before they reached the island. You might say we tried to embargo rain clouds. Um, and before that, we had Operation Popeye in Vietnam, where the slogan, the slogan was, Make Mud, Not War which happened from March of 1967 through July of 1972, which led to the Weather Warfare Ban or the Environmental Modification Convention. Um, it has a much longer title than that. Uh, the Convention for the Prohibition of Hostile Environmental Modification Techniques. Thank God they shortened that up. Um, but that was from around 1976 to 1978 between writing and ratification. Um, the Russian woodpecker Chernobyl meltdown and ionospheric heating over the USA. Creepy stuff. Uh, FOIAs aplenty. There's actually three of them on weathermodificationhistory.com. Weather is a force multiplier owning the weather in 2025, which was a think piece at the Air, um, Air College. Um, it's called Air Force 2025, but then it was actually reported to the Air Force and Army at a joint symposium, Test Technology Symposium 1997 Weather Modification by Dr. Arnold J. Barnes, and um, and then another uh, you know, idea put out there, Operational Defenses Through Weather Control in 2030, which was 2009, where they talked about basically protecting uh critical infrastructure and military infrastructure from directed energy weapons in space by creating artificial clouds, creating cloud layers from diamond-covered balloons and all kinds of other manner of things. 
Um, and I, of course, already mentioned Mahmoud Ahmadinejad says Europe stealing rain. Um, and then he says it again in 2012, followed up by Israel's cloud theft of a, over Iran. So we've covered cloud seeding. And in the weather modification category, the other big three probably would be lasers. Uh, rain-making lasers could trigger showers on demand. Artificial rain-making system in a way of natural phenomena. Create artificial rain by triggering the lightning. And laser lightning rods, triggering, guiding, and deviation of a long air spark discharges with femtosecond laser filament. Um, this was about Terra Mobile, a laser beam that they were using to actually, um, you know, blast very, very short bursts repeatedly to create an ionized column. And basically, electricity follows the path of path of least resistance so by creating an ionized channel in the sky you could actually get the lightning bolt to follow that laser beam down to the ground aka the laser lightning rod so we're back over here cloud ionizers this is electric weather modification the idea that you would release negatively charged ions that would then attract um, pollution that's already in the sky to stick together with the water and make it rain as opposed to dumping silver iodide or lead iodide or urea or even um, dry ice which is what cloud seeding is so cloud seeding up here is chemical uh, weather modification this is electric weather modification um, in this section down here Appreciate you for subscribing. I'm not even online right now. Um, <laughs> way to interrupt a local broadcast. Uh, <laughs> shocking electric weather modifications in um, 2019. You can see that on the front cover of uh, climateviewer.com right now. Website to be updated in the future. Lots to do. Little time to do it. And then finally, steering atmospheric rivers with Tesla, Tesla technology. And this is about, um, you know, Aqueous, CyBlue, um, Climate Control Global Trading LLC, Magnetic Technologies LLC, uh, WeatherGenerator.net. You know, the idea that you would steer atmospheric rivers in the sky. Um, and... You know, we'll get into all of that in another video. Still much to cover. Want to get through it pretty quickly. So then now we're over here to the sky heaters or space weather modification. Now, of course, I don't mention in this, um, this mind map anything about sounding rockets or chemical releases, upper atmospheric chemical releases from satellites and sounding rockets. Um, so like I said, maybe even this before I eventually release it to the public. We'll include that information as well, but we're just going to go through this real quick because this one's pretty obvious. 1968, solar-powered satellite weather control death ray. The idea that, um, the U as they put it, as long as the U.S. government considers it to be green energy, it cannot be considered a weapon system. Um, and Bernard Eastland passed away before he was able to go to the Weather Modification Conference and give his speech on steering cyclones with the thunderstorm solar-powered satellite. Um, but solar-powered satellites are exactly what they sound like. The idea is that you put solar panels in space, you convert that into a focused beam, you beam it down to the ground, and then you collect it with an antenna array to generate unlimited power. The problem with that is when you focus that much energy at the ground, you are going to modify the weather. And if you do it for a long enough period, you will modify the climate permanently. Bad idea. And then we have up here, um, you know, what sky heaters are basically ionospheric heaters. Um, the good, the bad, uh, good radiation belt remediation. We'll start there. The idea that basically if, if we had a Carrington event or a high altitude electromagnetic pulse that they could possibly suck the radiation out of the sky 
as the tether panel put it, use the harp facility in Alaska as a wind tunnel to determine the feasibility and engineering specifications of a mitigation system against high altitude electromagnetic pulse or massive solar flares, which would destroy all power grids on the planet and or cause simultaneous nuclear power plant meltdowns. There's 130 nuclear melt um, power plants just in America, 440 at least worldwide. Um, if we had a Carrington event today, it would you know, be damn near close to the end of life on the planet. So the idea of creating a mitigation system, or as they put it, satellite threat due to high altitude nuclear detonation at the Eisenhower Institute to use HARP to create artificial aurora by sucking radiation out of space rapidly through using, you know, basically high powered antennas, as we can see here, that these high power antennas would, you know, focus their energy into space. Um, and reflect that radiation and push it out to the poles and create artificial aurora, a mitigation system, if you will, as they like to put it. So that's actually a pretty good idea. I can get down with that. The bad part, though, is bioelectric effects on living organisms, destroying the Van Allen belts. Yes, somebody actually said that. I don't see why we would have them. Why don't we just get rid of them? Um, Secretary of Defense William Cohen on eco-terrorism with electromagnetic waves bad bad stuff um, and i did a big powerpoint presentation on that on all of this ionospheric heater space weather control and geophysical warfare you can see that on my youtube channel in the must see tv section and download the powerpoint yourself if you want to know more about this topic i've already covered most of it we'll probably recover it anyway um, you can also create extremely low capabilities, create extremely low frequency waves, artificial ionospheric mirror, which is pictured here all the way at the top, artificial mirror lens, um, which you can reflect laser beams off of. You can reflect freaking radio waves and all that stuff. Oh my, so much to talk about. Create plasma clouds. Naval research lab scientists produce densest artificial ionospheric plasma clouds using HARP. Um, Create artificial air glow. And air glow is, you know, look it up. It's beautiful. It's uh, basically looks like uh, you've turned on the shields to the Star Trek Enterprise. Um, but that's where literally the entire planet glows at the external um, interface between space and Earth. Um, and then create ionospheric holes, harp induced artificial ionospheric ducts. And then tomography, imaging of underground structure using HARP. I understand this was pretty much a monumental failure, but the idea was uh, that basically they could use the extremely low frequency waves that they create to then make them pass through underground structures and collect that with things like HALO, the HARP low far um, array, the low far is the low frequency array in um, Europe and that they could see underground tunnels and all of that sort of thing. So that brings us to the last and possibly worst section, the geoengineering section. And as I said earlier, accidental geoengineering with ship tracks and contrails, as MIT put it, we're about to kill a massive accidental experiment in reducing global warming, talking about ship tracks and bunker fuel, and then, um, as Chuck Long from NOAA's um, Earth System Research Lab said, we're talking about a subvisual contrail generated haze of ice, which we do not classify as a cloud, but gives the blue sky a more whitish tint, aka sky brightening. And you may have noticed this yourself that it, our blue skies are whiter than normal, that they're actually brighter than normal um and this was uh, on the smithsonian magazine with the title airplane contrails may be creating accidental geoengineering uh we could probably talk about just these two for a good hour gonna move along but these are the most controversial this one especially um because the contrail um 
problem is something everybody's talking about, but very few are talking about sky brightening from aviation and airlines, or as I like to call them, plane farts, because plane farts bad. A um, couple additional resources up here. I'm not going to get into that right now. About rebranding, geoengineering was originally coined in 1977 by Assessor A. Marchetti. Um, it, it was in going, people said, well, it's not really geo because geo means earth, which we're talking about climate. So let's call it climate engineering. And then they said, well, engineering's bad because you engineer cars, cars break. We don't want to break the climate. So instead of climate engineering, let's call it climate intervention. And then just as recently as 2018, 2019, uh, they started throwing around the idea of calling it climate restoration. So we've gone from geoengineering to climate restoration, WTF. Um, <laughs> all of the, the slave speak and Orwell would have a field day with just this alone. Uh, regardless, legal frameworks. Like I said, this is a lot about control. So in order to have control, you got to get a whole lot of people involved. So you have the Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative in 2010, Council on Foreign Relationships, talking about it also 2010, Council on Foreign Relationships, Planetary Scale Geoengineering. Um, the United States and the UK had a joint inquiry on geoengineering, which had uh, hearings in the House um, Science Committees, three of which uh, you can watch all three of these on my YouTube channel. Um, once again, for those who are just tuning in or missed half of this or a refresher, you can see these all on my YouTube channel. They are still available and they are on weathermodificationhistory.com. Um, but there were three hearings in Congress in 2010 and one in the parliament in the UK. Um, this is 2009 through 2010. Um, in 2015, the CIA was concerned that rogue geoengineering is undetectable. Alan Robach uh, blew the whistle on a phone call that he got from some CIA guys who asked if somebody was controlling the weather over America, would we know it? And the answer is resoundingly no. Um, then we have the forum on for climate engineering assessment, which used to be called the DC geoengineering group. But as we just talked about here, uh, geoengineering bad, climate engineering, new terminology. So they changed their name from DC geoengineering group to the forum for climate and engineering, climate engineering assessment, FCEA. Um, then there's a congressional hearing on geoengineering innovation, research and technology in 2017. So second time in front of Congress, this time only Democrats really involved um, brought it to the thing. Um, but that was another congressional hearing on uh, geoengineering. Forum on U.S. Solar Geoengineering Research at Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program. Um, Carnegie Climate Geoengineering Governance Initiative, C2G2, um, which is the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. Panelists call for creation of World Commission to Handle Solar Radiation Management 2018. Developing a research agenda and research governance approaches for climate intervention strategies that reflect sunlight to cool earth. Um, this was the National Academy of Sciences report um, and also led to the creation of the term climate intervention. And of course, and then 2019, UN geoengineering governance blocked by US and Saudi Arabia. So the United States and Saudi Arabia said, no, we don't want the UN to regulate geoengineering. And that's a complicated story in and of itself. So what are these geoengineering technologies? They can basically be broken down into two major categories, solar radiation management, or now they're just calling it solar geoengineering to make it short. So much for all those other terms sticking. Um, we've come full, full circle. They've gone through all these terms, and now solar geoengineering seems to be the most prevalent um, written by most people, and the other being carbon dioxide removal. Now, the... The carbon dioxide removal can be broken down into a couple different categories. Ocean iron fertilization, world's ro the world's first rogue geoengineer, Russ uh, George, um, he did the hottest salmon restoration project 
and he was dumping iron in the ocean to save fish, car- capture carbon. Um, and the idea was that basically, if you dump iron into the ocean, that it would bring phytoplankton blooms, and the phytoplankton feed on CO2, and they sequester it down at the bottom of the ocean. But more importantly for us, George, was the fact that international fishing had basically robbed um, their island of any local fishing source because all these international tankers are just scooping up fish by the millions on a daily daily basis to where they had no salmon, um, and he was dumping iron to bring the fish back. This is another one of those real hidden um, things in climate change that nobody wants to talk about, and that's overfishing of the ocean because that really screws with the the natural cycle of the planet. Um, Phytoplankton produces most of the oxygen we breathe and creates dimethyl sulfide, which creates clouds, which regulates the temperature of the planet, and it feeds the fish. So, I mean, bruh, save the ocean please direct air capture. And this is the idea that you basically make artificial trees. Um, I say make real trees, but whatever, um, David Keith is one of the guys who's invested in this technology who also argues for solar radiation management constantly, but regardless, he's, he's working both sides of the spectrum over here. So he's got direct air capture ideas as well. And this is just the idea of, you know, geoengineering with fake plastic trees or, you know, big giant um, wind tunnels that suck it in and filter out the CO2 and then pump it directly into the ground. Um, Then we have what's called bioenergy and with carbon capture and storage. BEX, um, if you want to learn about that, land-based geoengineering, BEX. A techno fix for the climate. Um, check that out from the ETC group. That's a video available on um, my YouTube channel. And then finally, biofuels. Um, biofuels could not help the climate. Using corn stalks, leaves, and cobs to make ethanol is leading to increased carbon dioxide emissions in fields due to loss of natural ground cover and fertilization. And those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Um, during the 1930s, we had the Dust Bowl, and that was because we over-farmed and we cut down too many trees. And in order to fix climate change in the past, we planted more trees. It was called the um, Great Plains Shelter Belt. The United States planted 220 million trees and paid farmers not to farm because over-farming monoculture crops and cutting down trees led to high winds, which led to soil erosion, which led to dust storms and what we call the Dust Bowl. So we've had climate change before. We fixed it with trees. Why would we not do that today? And then finally, back to that whole accidental geoengineering jet biofuel enlisted for contrail control. This all is a story for another day. Last but certainly not least, the most hated um, idea of all solar radiation management or creating artificial volcanoes using all manner of things, all the things. Um, but the important you know, takeaway from this is Noah gets go ahead to study controversial climate plan B. There's another thing you'll hear a lot, climate plan B. So plan A is to cut back emissions. Plan B is make artificial volcanoes block out the sun because the sun is what's heating us up, don't you know? So that's what we should stop. Um, U.S. government has approved funds for geoengineering research, the largest of which is the National Science Foundation. They're handing out the most money. Um, And this can literally be broken into two main categories, which is stratospheric aerosol injection, or mimicking volcanoes, what volcanoes do naturally, um, that you would spray a whole bunch of sulfur, aluminum, titanium, calcium carbonate, or they've even discussed diamond dust into the stratosphere. And the reason why you would want to do it into the stratosphere, let's just show that tape one more time, 
is that the stratosphere is at least, you know, 39,000 feet. It's, you know, or 30, it's, it's high enough. The higher you go, the longer the chemicals, the aerosols stay. It's what's called the resident time. So by injecting those types of chemicals into the stratosphere, which is also where the ozone layer is, which is bad news bears. You don't want to destroy the ozone, but they get the idea that either by creating noctilucent clouds um, in the mesosphere or possibly nacreous clouds, um, artificial noctilucent or nacreous clouds, and then just by widely dispersing sulfur, titanium, aluminum, calcium carbonate, possibly diamond dust, um, that they could reflect sunlight back to space, which would cool the planet down until, you know, all the industries get their act together and stop polluting. Um, and I'm all for pollution reduction, uh, but I don't think that the full narrative is really being told the way I see it. Um, and the other big idea is what's called marine cloud brightening. And this is the idea that's very similar to what we talked about over here um, with, you know, we're about to kill a massive accidental experiment to reduce, reduce global warming. Ship tracks. Ship tracks and marine cloud brightening are essentially the same thing that we would take sea salt or other chemicals to create artificial clouds or to enhance the clouds that are already there to reflect sunlight back to space. So make the clouds whiter so they reflect more light. Um, and that's that's basically marine cloud brightening in a nutshell. Now, consequences. Um, Alan Robach, same guy who blew the whistle on the CIA, also put out a paper called Stratospheric Sulfur Geoengineering Benefits and Risks, and then put out a paper called 27 Reasons Stratospheric Geoengineering is a Bad Idea. And I fully agree with this. Um, in fact, let's take a look at it. And he gives them right here, you know, six good reasons, benefits to geoengineering, 25, uh, I thought it was 27 uh, bad reasons to geoengineer, including military use of technology at the bottom. Um, had many a discussion with these geoengineering guys, and for years they would deny this was even a thing. And I'm very proud that I think I helped in, you know, convince plus a call from the CIA, I'm sure had something to do with in, you know, in getting him to include military use of technology. But regardless, uh, we'll go back. So there are many consequences to this. The fact that it would change rainfall patterns on a worldwide basis, um, that as they put it on Ken Caldera's geoengineering group, SRM geoengineering, how to deal with the losers. That if you start geoengineering, it's hard to stop. Or as Seth Baum put it, the double catastrophe theory. Intermittent stratospheric geoengineering induced by societal collapse. Um, the idea that either we just monetarily couldn't do it or we had, you know, the Carrington event and all the power is out so you can't fly the planes that do the geoengineering, double catastrophe. That we have a World War Three, so we're too busy killing each other to go and geoengineer, so now the climate's going to have a rebound effect, double catastrophe. Um, and the one that I bring up most often, that if volcano, volcanic eruptions were to occur while you were geoengineering, then you could very quickly end up in an ice age because when you were trying to cool the planet by blocking sunlight and then a huge volcano goes off, let alone multiple ones, now we got a serious freaking problem. So this all leads us back to the last point of this video, that climate change legislation is about control of human and natural resources. Agendas, control of resources. Natural resources, water, oil, and gas, 
and I've summarized this in a PowerPoint presentation, which you can check out here. The climate changers and water wars, technocracy, geoengineering, and replacing the water cycle. Again, this is in my must-see TV section on my YouTube channel. Quick reminder, there's my YouTube channel. Click on must-see TV playlist. It's on the front page. You can't miss it. Um, so let's go back to this. And climate change agendas and agreements. Um, of course, in there we have the usual suspects, Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, the Paris Accord, COP21, and the New Green Deal. Um, you know, I did a presentation on that as well. New Green Deal, Agenda 2030, Technocracy and Geoengineering. Um, actually, I think that's just an article, but whatever. Um, all of this is based in what's called communitarian law and technocracy. And communitarian law is international laws that circumvent constitutional law for the greater good. So if you don't know what communitarian law is, you're not going to understand what they're trying to achieve by passing these international accords to circumvent your local laws, let alone your national laws. And technocracy was a movement started in the 1930s um, that, you know, basically George Orwell believed that technocracy would result in a scientific dictatorship. And that's pretty much what we're, what we're seeing is that technocrats seek to control all facet, facets of global life through policies and technological methods. Um, thank you to Patrick Wood, author of Technocracy Rising. Um, great book. You got to read it. And it really explains where the ideology of all of this originates. And finally, human resources control human behavior because you know, you're bad and your car is bad and the way you pollute is bad. So they do that through multiple mechanisms. And I break those down in my propaganda, fake news and activism page. And it features things like the anatomy of slave speak, mind control of field guide to master the to language that maintains the master slave relationship, slave speak TV playlist, where you can see things like Human Resources, Social Engineering in the 20th Century, which is a documentary on this sort of thing. But out of the negative and into the positive, what are the finally the solutions? The solutions to, to all of this, to, uh, the, the solutions to climate change, the solutions to the climate changers, all of the people intentionally doing all of these things is pretty simple. Plant trees, clean the ocean, deal with climate change today. Pollution and deforestation. Very simple. Focus on the now. Do what you can about what's going on now. And we probably won't have to worry about um, global warming in the future. And I think everybody can agree on that. We want clean water. We want clean air. Um Planting trees is a good idea. Keeping the ocean safe, not overfished, not full of plastic freaking bottles and poison um, is a good idea. Transparency verification and ensure that weather modification is used for benevolent purposes. I don't think we're going to stop this, you know, billion, multi-billion dollar, if not trillion dollar industry, let alone the fact that the militaries of Russia, China, and America are involved in weather modification activities. But the least we can expect right now, at least today as a first step, is transparency so that we know when it's occurring. And that's why I proposed the Environmental Modification Accountability Act. As we said earlier, NMOD was a weather warfare ban, but how do we know if anybody's doing weather warfare? So it's important that we understand if somebody is doing weather warfare by separating the people who say they're doing it for a good reason and the people who don't tell us at all. And the only way to do it is to catch them in the act because government secrets, because national security, because economic warfare, because weather warfare. And the only way to protect ourselves against weather warfare and the climate changers who would work in the shadows 
um, like has always happened with Henry Kissinger and the CIA, Operation Popeye in Vietnam, Project Nile Blue in Cuba, probably what's going on in Iran today. Um, there are many actors out there who stand to benefit by plausible deniability of weather warfare. I didn't do it. God did it. I didn't do it. Climate change did it. We need the truth. And then finally, sustainability and green energy solutions. Um, and by green energy solutions, I mean thinking about the entire process from creation to destruction and recycling of these energy processes. Because as many people know, um, the creation of solar panels is a very dirty industry. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be covering in a video in the near future, that solar far, um, wind farms, that the blades aren't actually recyclable and that they're actually, I've got a, a satellite photo of them basically, you know, tearing down, you know, it's a, you know, like a dump truck, you know, the a front end loader kind of pusher. And it's literally pushing this monstrous pile of these blades from the windmill farms. And the, the pusher is this big, like this tiny little dot in a field this large, tiny little dot of this huge, massive thing with all these blades stacked on top of each other. And it's like five, six football fields of it that they're about to literally just cover with dirt because they cannot, you know, recycle them. And these are poisonous made from concrete and polymers and all of that. So is it really green energy? I mean, what is green energy? And I want to, you show me, I want to find it. Um, I hope that we can find a solar solution that doesn't, you know, literally pollute everything on the planet to create it. Um, but, you know, we'll have to find that. Victory Gardens. The idea that during World War II, um, everybody, you know, couldn't supply, you know, basically rely on the global flu food um, distribution, you know, processes that had been, you know, that we're used to today. And um, especially in a time where right now we're talking about um, you not, might not be able to get toys this Christmas because, um, you know, basically the whole world screwed up and because of things we're not going to mention right now um, and shipping is screwed up and all of that, that it should reiterate the idea that globalization is good for ideas, but not for <laughs> practical solutions. So I say decentralize everything. Everything that you should need for your life at as much as possible should be done locally. As local as possible. So the idea is very simple and it's it's just like you would talk about in the computer world redundancy um you know multiple fail points the idea that you could completely fail here but you've got all of these backups over here um that i don't have to worry about the fact that all of our apples come from the west coast that, you know, we've got other crops that we can rely on in the meantime while they're not able to ship all this stuff or, you know, that we're all reliant on meat from another place or whatever the thing is. You know, masks come to mind whenever we realize that all the masks were made in China and we had to, like, very quickly go, well, we don't have enough masks. We got to make them here in America. We don't make shoes anymore here in America. I mean, it's just, the list is infinite. Um, so I say decentralize all the things um, as local as possible. Plant trees, get verification, um, and have systems of being able to detect all of these climate changing technologies and make them publicly available and transparent, and then decentralize everything. I think that's a great solution, um, which kind of just brings me to the last point. You know, a lot of you asked for it, and I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to doing it. 
Uh, we want to talk about, you know, some merch. And not only are, is this going to be available as a poster that you can buy in the near future, but it kind of summarizes the whole idea of what we're dealing with right now. This idea of man-made versus nature. That is the heart of the climate changers. And you can, you know, it's very, <laughs> I mean, a picture's worth a thousand words and that's it right there. The farmer versus the lawyer, the businessman, whoever you want that to be. But the idea that um, there are those who would control the weather and create chaos and profit from it. And then there are the people who have the simple life who provide and don't want any of that. They don't need any of that. I think it's a beautiful image. Uh, bravo to Dominic um, Marama, my homeboy, uh, for making this. And uh, I think I got another one over here. And then from the cover image, as you can see here, this was the cover image. Um, this is actually going to be a t-shirt that we're going to sell in the near future. And uh, that is it right there, the climate changers. And that's actually uh, Vincent Schaefer and Irving Langmire um, hanging out over what was originally the cloud chamber when they invented cloud seeding. It says weathermodificationhistory.com on the bottom. It's got a nice little uh, plain fart trail there. And uh, the climate changers. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. You, would you like to buy a t-shirt that look like that? I, I, is, it, is it snazzy enough for you? Um, maybe a poster like that. New things coming. New things always on the horizon. Um, there will be uh, a merch shop in the near future. I hope to get that out there. Um, thank you for sticking through this video um, and seeing the big picture. And we'll go into more detail about each of the individual you know, categories of this. All of these different technologies um, to control the weather in a in in a video series, and I will literally make a playlist called the Climate Changers, and we'll do kind of similar to what we did with Cirrus Clouds Matter. I do have some more updates on that series as well. Um, so please continue to support my work. Um, if you can sign up for the Patreon, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, the lowest tier is two dollars. I mean, if if just you know five hundred of you. Uh, I have 24,000 subscribers. If 500 of you literally signed up at $2, I would have all my bills paid and no, no more stress and be able to devote even more time to doing what I love, which is building these things and uh, making these videos. So please consider doing that. And uh, recognize that, you know, all of this I do because I, I, I need the information. Um, knowing is half the battle. And with information comes power. With power comes great responsibility. So please use this information and all the information I've provided on weathermodificationhistory.com, climateviewer.com, and climateviewer.org to attack ideas, not people. Love you, mean it.